Yeah, just to... Um, how things been? How's camping? Oh, so good, man. Um, oh, like we're right on the beach side, literally us, a few rocks, and then the water, and then um, yeah. it, like because it's so warm and stuff, just had a the mesh for getting insects out, but you can see the moon, the stars, everything, just sleep sleeping like that. Slept each night at like eight o'clock. Woke up at five with sunrise. It's, it's cool. Um, All right. Ready, so what yeah? I think you do, yeah, when so you do the introduction, and then after that, uh, I'll share the screen. Yep. And I think what you do is you just read the, you read the, like the MCQs yep. and the the options. Yeah. And then I'm just gonna have I'm just gonna rift. Yeah. And, that's fine. Because and, and then we... and then you can help me out as well. Stan here, this is Anesthesia Copy Break, and we have a very special live episode. Now, we haven't we haven't been on for a while just because of so many other projects going on, but we're, we're going to get back to regularity. I've got a lot more time. I'm doing a sabbatical project, so I have a lot more time for doing this as well. Um, and this episode is going to be about Stan Tay doing some MCQs live. Um, these MCQs are from the BMJ, and it's going to be, it's going to be tricky, Stan. Um, welcome, and uh, great to have you doing this live. <laughs> Mate, you just put me in a corner. I, I thought we agreed that we would do this together. Oh, sorry. Not, uh, yeah, I will. not just by myself, hey? Yeah, sorry, Stan. No, I'll definitely help you out as best I can. But we, but we know the MCQs are really hard. Like, you know, if it wasn't for past papers and just really nuanced study of those big textbooks, MCQs are really difficult. So I think, I think, it's, um, I think it's a great challenge to do this live uh, on, a, on a podcast and on YouTube. Um, so yeah, actually, b- before we before we get cracking with that, Stan, big congratulations! So I think you've had, you know, you do a lot of teaching for the um, Northwest Training Scheme. Obviously, run that program, and you got twelve out of twelve people through that. So you know, really well done. And, and I, you know, I'm sure all your Adrenaline Memories crew also has a really good success rate with the last exam. So yeah, r- really well done. No, oh, thanks to you, Lars, because well, you're part, actually part of that program as well. And I think the biggest achievement has always been the, not just the trainees that are sitting the first time, but the trainees who, who are sitting the, you know, um, the second or third time. And those are the greatest actually achievements that uh, I've done. So very, very happy, very relieved actually. Yeah. <laughs> These- and I've, been, I've actually been celebrating. So um, I do apologize if I do go a little bit off script because uh, I have had a couple of, uh, of, uh, of beers to uh, celebrate this weekend, <laughs> all right? Look, as long as we're not Which is why everything has been impromptu. Literally, I was out this afternoon and like last message me going, oh, let's let's do something this afternoon. And I said, look, fantastic. All right, why don't we just uh, bring yeah. everyone together? Let's just do an impromptu M- MCQ session. This is not planned at all. And nothing is, nothing's been, nothing has been scripted at all. So I, um, everything is just gonna be on the fly here. Very exciting. Beautiful. So, Stan, we'll, let's get cracking. So, I'll, I think I'll get you to share the screen. I'll read these MCQs. All right. Yeah. So, okay. So, these are, yeah, these are the BMJ uh, MCQs, which I've got. Okay. And we can get, in fact, what we can do is we can get, yeah, everyone else to sort of share um, their thoughts as well in terms of what the answers are. Okay. I think that'd be great. All well, right. So, like, what I think you should do is, why don't you read out the question, read out the options, mm-hmm. and then let me have a think through okay. them. Sounds good. Okay, question one, uh, this is question one of 10. Is it true that folic acid metabolism may be affected by the following? And so you've got to put true false for each of the, true or false for each of these medications. Tetracycline, methotrexate, ibuprofen, uh, pyrimethamine, and vitamin B12. So what, those are the options. Um, Stan, what do you reckon? And everyone, right. everyone have so a go. I, I definitely know methotrexate stands out because I know that uh, a lot of patients who do take uh, methotrexate have to be on uh, folic acid. So definitely methotrexate because I know that it uh, inhibits tetrahydrofolate reductase. Mm-hmm. Now, tetracycline is definitely a no. So it's an antibiotic, inhibits protein synthesis, uh, specifically the 30S ribosome. Ibuprofen, no, it's a non steroidal anti inflammatory. Vitamin B12, no, happy to say that. Pyrimethamine. La, what is pyrimethamine? 
Look, uh, I, I've never heard of this medication. It's a, it's a, it's, it's an amine. It's a, it's compounded with essential <laughs> amino acid. <laughs> um, there's probably some um, car carbon bond there with the meth. Uh, yeah, is it some kind of antibiotic or? Is it some kind of catecholamine type structure? Maybe. Uh, wouldn't be catecholamine. I, I definitely think that in the theme of what it's been, um, what's there in terms of the options, uh, you, you'd want to use it to treat, you know, specifically bacteria, cancer, uh, that where, where folate is important in terms of DNA synthesis. So Piri, yeah, in fact, Piri sounds very um, DNA, doesn't it, La? What do you, what do you, what are your thoughts with that? Well, why do you think it sounds DNA? Aren't there, aren't there like? Um, I mean, I think it's pir pyrazinamide. Yeah. Um, I don't know. Yep. Tough one. It's a 50-50 one. Does anyone okay. else have any clues in the audience? I, I look, I definitely know methotrexate is one. I'm so um okay, I'm gonna put true for methotrexate, yeah, false for tetra, false for ibuprofen, false for vitamin B12. And let's ask the audience. Okay. And what does go. the audience think in terms of the pyrimethamine? Are we we have someone saying because it sounds like meta, I would say it impacts folate, high grade thing in here. Um, so yeah, okay, good. Yeah. I like that. I like that that's the, uh, logic. that's the only solution we got so far. So shall we go with true for pure? We'll go with true. All right, let's go. Yes. Let's submit our answer. Yes, hey, great, great one, good one. Audience help. <laughs> that is a great start. <laughs> that's right. All right, La, it, can you read the explanation for that? Great. Drugs which inhibit dihydrofo sorry, dihydrofolate reductase include methotrexate, pyrimethamine, and trimethoprim. So that's yeah. a really okay. good mnemonic there, really. Having the metho, metho, metho there, that's, that, that's a great mnemonic now, especially uh -huh. after what ah, right. that's a good from pick the up. audience. <laughs> Drugs which interfere yes. with the absorption and storage of folate include phenytoin, uh, primidone, and oral contraceptives. Let's see if we can make a mnemonic out of that. So drugs can interfere absorption and storage of folate, phenytoin, primidone, oral contraceptives. We can, have, we can work on that. Tetracyclines, vitamin B12 and ibuprofen do not interfere with folic acid metabolism. Great. Okay, good. One one. And um, the, one, in fact, the one that they don't have here is sulfonamide. So sulfonamides and inhibit dihydrofolate synthase. Okay, mm. so... Um, uh, that would be another one of the drugs that you would want to add on to this list here. But okay, methotrexate, methotrexate, pyrimethamine. What? Trimethoprine. Wait, can you find out what pyrimethamine does? Yeah, does it? Let's just let's just do a quick Google because it's definitely not one of the ones we seem to use in anesthesia much. Pyrimethamine. Where have I? I've never seen that before. Sold on the brand name Daraprim, among us, medication used with leucovorin to treat the parasitic diseases toxoplasmosis and sister isosporiasis. <laughs> that is a now, toxoplasmosis <laughs> and sister isosporiasis. Say that last few times. Um, and it's used to treat those. It is also used to, uh, with Dapsone as a second line option to prevent pneumocystis, uh, Girovecci pneumonia, so PCP, uh, in people with HIV AIDS. Okay. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Learn. You know what they say? You learn something new every day. Okay. Isn't that a true thing? Okay. Good. All right. All right. Happy to go with the next one. Yep. All right. Well done, everyone. That was good. Good. Off to a good start. Okay. Oh, what is this? Question right. two. A 73 year old woman is admitted to the medical admissions unit. She's known to have type 2 diabetes, normally controlled by diet, but has felt generally unwell for the past 48 hours. On examination, she has a pulse rate of 110 beats per minute, blood pressure of 90 on 50, and is clinically dehydrated. Her respiratory rate is 20 breaths per minute with no focal signs on chest auscultation. Okay, so the following results are available. Glucose, 27.4 millimoles per liter, range 3.5 to 5.5. 
ketones 2.5. So that's elevated, it should be less than 0.1. Urinary glucose is zero. And that's a dipstick with ketones. Um, on review of her notes, during a visit to the diabetic clinic one month prior to admission, a random blood glucose measured 15.3 millimoles per liter and a urinary dipstick registered a high glucose and ketones plus plus. Which of the following physiological mechanisms best explains the discrepancy between plasma and urinary glucose measurements? What is going on here? All right, can you, can you read through the options that I can choose? Yeah. Okay, the options are the renal plasma glucose threshold. So, I mean, let's, let's just to summarize this. She's di type 2 diabetic. Yeah. And she's unwell for the 48, 48 hours. She looks a little bit septic or, I mean, clinically dehydrated, sorry, because of the low blood pressure and tachycardia, mild tachycardia. Um, the glucose is 27, ketones 2.5, but urinary glucose is zero. So, essentially, what we're zero, having, but yeah, with ketones. That's right. So, right. you've got ketones present in blood and urine, but glucose only in your um, blood, but not in her urine. So why is there a discrepancy is the real question here. And the options are <clears throat> the renal plasma glucose threshold is abnormally low. The glomerular filtration rate is abnormally low. The amount of splay in the glucose reabsorption curve is abnormally increased. <clears throat> the glucose transport maximum TM is abnormally high and the glucose transport maximum TM is abnormally low. Okay. Uh, um, so what I think is really interesting here is that uh, uh, with no glucose in the urine, mm -hmm. and we know that previously she has had high glucose of uh, 15, and she has had glucose in the urine with ketones. And with regards to the idea of glucose transport maximum, that should be around 10 or, or so, 10 to 12, depending on what textbook you read, maybe 10 to 12 for your normal GFR. Um, now, can it? Can it go up or can it go down? I feel like transport maximum is inherent. I don't, I don't think, I, does it change? Yeah, it's, 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 an, it's an inherent thing. I don't think it changes. Yeah. Um, uh, it's definitely not A, that the threshold is not abnormally low because if it's abnormally low, it means that you should get more glucose in the urine. So it's not A. Splay talks about... Um, the idea where it's about the maximum amount of transport of glucose um, in terms of the reabsorption versus what is possible. And the difference uh, is because of splay. And, and, and that's the idea that uh, not all tubules act identical. So I, it's definitely not splay mm -hmm. because it's, it's completely zero. Mm -hmm. uh, is it because the maximum is it normally high? Look, look she, she's definitely got GFR. She's shocked. Mm -hmm. You know, she's going at 110 beats per minute. Um, she's on the lower end of blood, you know, her, her blood pressure. She's clinically dehydrated. So I know that she's shocked in terms of yeah. uh, volume-wise. So I know that her and GFR is going to be low. So, so number, two is, number two statement is correct. And there's only one option required here. So does that seem like the most correct to you? Well, I guess the question is, can can the glucose transport maximum be high? Because that's the other option. But if, if it's high, if it's high, it has to be above 20, 27. And that's, that, sounds, that sounds unreasonable. And I think that um, when we think about transport of glucose, it's not just a concentration, but it's actually um, the amount you deliver per unit time. So I'm, I'm going to go with option number two. What are your thoughts, La? Yeah, I mean, I've just got this sense, again, it's been such a long time since I've studied this aspect of renal, but transport maximum, I feel like it's an it's a existing state. It doesn't change that much. It's not going to change over this kind of um, time frame that, she, that she's presented with. 
And or, yeah, so I'd, I'd go with my GFR being abnormally low um, in this shock state maybe. Um, now we've got a comment in the chat. I would think the only reason there's no glucose in the urine is because there's none getting into the tubule in the first place. Yeah, exactly. So yeah, I think yep. we've got a couple of consensus to go B. So shall we crack on, see what they well, say? Well, in actual fact, um, with that statement, there has to be something getting through because remember there's, there's ketones in the urine. Yes. So I think that uh, there is still, you know, that there is still a, there's a reduced amount of GFR, um, obviously, because you're still having, because you're still being able to uh, filter ketones and ketones are not uh, reabsorbed. And so therefore that's why there's ketones, but I'm assuming that because of the low GFR Actually, and because of the transport maximum, hold on, hold on. You think about it in terms of um, per minute, it's about, from memory, about two millimoles. Yeah, yeah. So, I, so As in, is the transport maximum affected by the rate of delivery of fluid to the, G, to the glomerulus? In which case, <sighs> the fact that they're shocked means that you know it what? Might I be don't. Normally high. Yeah. Mm. I, I don't know. I don't know. I, I look. I could be wrong. I, I don't think so. I don't know. But I, I've got the feeling that that two seems to be. I mean, two is a. Two is a correct statement. You know, the GFR is abnormally low um, because of the state. And I, I agree with the statement that um, that would mean that there's a reduced amount of glucose being delivered as well as a reduced amount of ketones as well. Um, and I think logically, if it's below a, you know, because of the re reduced GFR, even though they've got high amounts of concentration in the, um, in the blood, because of the reduced amount, it's below the transport maximum. Um, and so that there still is, there's, there still is, um, able to ha uh, have reabsorption of curling tubules so much so that there's no, there's no urine glucose. Um, but there are ketones. All right. I'm going to go with I'm, I'm, two. I'm changing my answer to four, Sam. Four. <laughs> yeah. What does the audience think? I've got some, I mean, there's some good thoughts in the chat. I, I really like the fact that, um, someone has said TM equals GFR times plasma glucose, therefore TM may not be reached with a very low GFR. That's a very good statement there. It's accounting not just for low GFR, but the fact that it relate, the GFR relates to transport maximum. That, that statement there. Uh, yeah, I agree that, yeah, TM will not be reached until there's a very low GFR. And you know what? She could have a very low GFR because yeah. she's 73, been unwell for 48 hours, clinically dehydrated. And, you know, 110 minutes, it doesn't sound fast, but I would say I'd be concerned for a 73 year old at 110, but be, at 110 beats per minute. Yeah. All right. Is it a two or four? All right. I'm going with two. You're going with four. Okay. I'm going with four. All right. Let's, what happens. let's go. All right. Fingers Woo. crossed. Hey guys. Woo. Loading. This is exciting. <laughs> this is not a bad way of learning. Yes. Oh, you got it. <laughs> <laughs> oh my okay. goodness me. Correct. All right. Uh, all right. <laughs> like, have, have, a, have a read yeah. of this. The glucose molecule is freely filtered into the Bowman's capsule to form part of the filtrate. When blood glucose concentrations are below a certain threshold, approximately 11, all the glucose is reabsorbed into the proximal convoluted tubule. This is facilitated by active transport. The proteins, are respons uh, the proteins responsible are sodium glucose co-transporters, SGLT1 and T2, in the proximal tubular cells. Below the renal threshold, glucose does not normally appear in the urine. Above the renal threshold, the active transport process becomes saturated, so the transport maximum for glucose, or TMG, and any glucose not reabsorbed appears in the urine. The renal glucose threshold is not fixed, as it is dependent on a number of factors. GFR, TMG, and the amount of splay. Okay, nice. The, the splay is the rounding of a glucose reabsorption curve and results from the, the different absorptive and filtering capacity of individual nephrons. The SGLT proteins have high affinity, but not infinite affinity for glucose. So the SGLT proteins have high affinity, but not infinite affinity for glucose. Thus, some glucose may escape reabsorption before the TMG or tra transplant maximum is reached, uh, and an increase in splay may lead to a decrease in renal threshold. 
So a low GFR leads to an increase in the TMG because the filtered glucose load is reduced and the PCT, the proximal convoluted tubule, can reabsorb all the filtered glucose despite hyperglycemia. Conversely, a reduction in the TMG reduces the threshold because the tubules have a diminished capacity to reabsorb glucose. The most obvious case of the discrepancy between plasma and urinary glucose in this scenario is reduction of GFR caused by severe dehydration and reduced perfusion pressure. Okay, nice. And I really like this bit here. The, re the re renal glucose threshold is not fixed and is dependent on a number of factors, which is GFR, um, TMG, and the amount of splay. Okay, I think that's good. good one to remember. Can you go down to the bottom paragraph there in the answer? So low GFR leads to an increase in the transport maximum glucose because the filtered glucose load is reduced. Okay, yeah, we agree with that. And the PCT can reabsorb all the filtered glucose despite hyperglycemia. Despite hyperglycemia. Oh. Conversely, a reduction in the TMG reduces the threshold um, because the tubules have a diminished capacity to reabsorb glucose. The most obvious cause of the discrepancy between plasma and urinary glucose in this scenario is a reduction of GFR caused by severe dehydration and reduced perfusion pressure. Interesting, because they do say it's an increase in TMG as well as a low GFR. Can you go up to the answer again? Just check the wording of the answer. The glucose translation is normally high. Oh, and that, that's a true statement as well, based on that. Mm. Oh, interesting. Okay. So, oh, okay. It's, it's one of those best explained, isn't it? Yes. The, it's, in, the, I guess initial you're right. thing, the initial thing is the low GFR, which then causes the transport maximum. So maybe that's, oh, that's a bit unsatisfying. <laughs> <laughs> no, look, see, is it described incorrectly? Leads to an increase in the TMG. A low GFR leads to an increase in the TMG. Why would it lead to an increase in the TMG? I thought well, the TMG would be would be fixed given how much glucose is being because the amount of glucose filtered is um, is reduced. So why why would there meet why would there need to be an increase in the TMG? If you've got reduced the amount of glucose coming through, you don't you don't actually need to reabsorb more glucose. The t the transport maximum is relate depend on the GFR. The yeah, I mean true. Um, I mm, is it yeah interesting one. Anyway, okay, that's, yeah, that's a good okay. discussion. <laughs> good discussion point. If anyone has, has any ideas, uh, yeah, let us know. But uh, I always thought in terms of the uh, transport maximum, it was a set amount of concentration per unit time. And therefore, if you reduce the amount of filtered glucose, which is happening here with from the re from the reduced GFR, it just means that there's less glucose um, being delivered to the to the tubules, which means that given the fixed rate of, of uh, reabsorption, you're able to take up all that. But yeah, didn't think that it that uh, TMG was affected, but uh, the wording here suggests that it is. Interesting. Mm. All right. Because if it is, if it is, don't you think that this that this graph here would show that the TMG would would move up, wouldn't it? Yeah. Uh, within within would, the, that, would that be correct with logic with no, your logic? Is that, no, uh, no. that that there's a, there's a limit to it, right? So the TMG is related to glucose reabsorbed. Yeah. Up to a certain point. Yep. Oh, so maybe that's why it's not abnormally high. It's it's proportionately high. Maybe proportionate. Uh, yeah, maybe proportionate. Uh, <laughs> okay. Right. I'll accept the proportion. I won't accept an absolute though. All right. Let's go next one. Doesn't matter. I got it right. Two out of two, that's what's important. <laughs> okay, question three. Regarding peripheral nerve stimulators used for performing nerve blocks. These are true or false statements again, there are five options. Stimulation in the mid inguinal line causes plantar flexion, requires three connection leads for the skin, needle and the earth. Using an insulator needle improves the success rate for the block. They deliver a stimulus lasting one to two seconds. 
And finally, prior to injecting the local anesthetic, the ideal current is one to two milliamperes at a frequency of one to two hertz. Okay, let's, all right. True, false statements, let's work through these. Uh, so plant, plant deflection will be tibial nerve, agree? Mm -hmm. If you, because dorsiflexion is um, deep perineal. Mm -hmm. If you get stimulation of the mid inguinal line, that is uh, anterior, like you get, you know, you'd be getting femoral, you wouldn't be getting sciatic. I think that A is incorrect. Um, requires three connection leads for the skin, needle, and, and the earth. Uh, no, I think it, it's always uh, just two. So it's um, uh, the needle and then also the skin. And then after that, um, there's no earthing here. So I don't think it's one or two. Mm -hmm. Using an insulated needle improves the success rate for the block. I don't know that one. Um, they, I'll just leave that for a second. They deliver a stimulus lasting one to two seconds. That's very long. That is very long. I don't think that's right. You know, one to, one to two seconds is very long for a stimulus. Like I would think, I would think any stimulus you deliver straight to a nerve um, would have to be less than one second. And prior to injecting local anesthetic, the ideal current is one to two milliamps at a frequency of one to two hertz. Uh, two hertz. So one to two milliamps uh, every one second. It sounds low enough. Mm. I think that's okay. I think that's, I'll say that's true. What, what do you think what's sealer? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I think insulated needles are newer technology. So potentially that, se that seems like it could be true. I think all the needles we use are insulated needles because you don't want, you don't want the whole needle um, stimulating every part of the tissue. Like you want yeah. only the tip, right? So that's why you'd have an insulated needle. Um, okay. Therefore, that would make sense. That success rate of block, you wouldn't be, uh, you wouldn't be contracting unnecessary or you know, extra tissues on the way to the nerve, because you know you okay. want you want muscle contraction at, at the point uh, that the nerve's causing, not anything else. So yeah, I reckon that's true, and I think you're right about the one to two milliamps. But I think you know forty to seventy on the skin, it would be a magnitude of ten lower near the nerve. I think that makes sense. So. Uh, like, it's been so long since I've done a peripheral nerve stimulator needle block technique, and it felt yeah. like it was very low currents. Out. Very low. Very, I know that and, I look, yeah. I don't use a nerve stim for my blocks, and I do a lot of blocks mm. uh, in and, the and work that I do. I do remember and, it being at one to two hertz, as in, yep. bup, 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 was like the, the frequency. And I think the frequency only lasted, like you said, not one second, lasted like 100 milliseconds or something very yeah, yeah, short. Yeah, very short. I agree, very, very short. Like one to two seconds is, sounds very long. To <laughs> Torturous. Me. Absolutely, 100%. And I'm just not sure, oh, C, you know, C is very clinical. It's very clinical based. Yeah. It's a very clinical based uh, statement here mm. using an insulated needle. But, you know, I think that the advocates of nerve steam would say that C would be correct. So look, I'll say C and, and you know what? E sounds... He sounds right too. So, all right. Happy with every, happy with those answers? Lock it in. Feel free, guys, to put it in the right. chat. Insulin needle equals mo more focused beam of stimulation, lower chance of being in the wrong place, stimming the nerve? Question mark. Yeah, I think that's what we're saying. Partially oh. incorrect. Oh, no. <laughs> oh, sorry. Okay. Explanation. Oh, it's even lower. Okay. Read out the, um, read yeah. out the answers there. Exclama explanation. The nerve stimulators used for performing needle blocks deliver a stimulus which lasts one to two milliseconds, not seconds. Yep, there are only said. two leads, not yep, three, three, one for the skin and the other to the needle. A current of 0.25 to 0.5 milliamps, not oh, one to two milliamps, oh, wow. at a frequency of one to two hertz is preferred prior to injection of local anesthetic. Muscular contraction 
at the lowest possible current indicates that the needle tip is closer to the nerve. Insulated needles have been shown to improve block success rate since only the needle tip is conducting current, makes sense. Stimulation of the femoral nerve in the mid inguinal line causes contraction of the quadriceps and knee extension. That is the dancing patella, not plantar flexion. Yep. Okay. Okay. There you go. So it's even less. So it's not. It's half that of the one to two milliamps. Yeah. So there you <laughs> and, go. and I mentioned the hundred milliseconds is one to two milliseconds. So this is, you know, incredibly yeah, short. You're, uh, that last one to two milliseconds. Mm. Oh, even yeah. shorter. Again, you've got to, right. it's, it's probably something to encourage, you know, if you haven't done a technique, whatever it is, just to do it, because once you've done it and you, you know, it's hopefully recent in your memory, you'll, you'll remember yep. this kind of stuff for your, for your exam. Yeah. But one to two milliseconds is very, very quick. It's mm. very quick. Yeah. Not seconds. Okay. There you go. All right. Next one. Let's go. <clears throat> Question four, is catecholamine secretion stimulated by the following? And again, there's five true or, for, true or false options. Hypothermia, hypoglycemia, hypoxemia, pain, and hypercapnia. Okay. Um, I'm going to say things that would uh, increase your sympathetic stimulation. So hypoxemia pain, hypercapnia. Now, tricky one is, I don't think it's hypothermia, but hypoglycemia. Um, you would think that that would be in response to hypoglycemia, but I guess that if you were hypoglycemic for whatever reason, and, and, uh, and, and the thing is, if you weren't able to actually launch an appropriate response, you would be, you would still remain to be hypoglycemic. Does that make sense? Like, I, in other words, what I'm saying is that, uh, you know, if you were, if you were able to launch an appropriate response, you shouldn't be hypoglycemic anymore. Hmm. Yeah. But, but as in that would be true for hypoglycemia. Hmm. I see what you mean. Yeah. No, as in, I think we've seen this clinically, someone becomes hypoglycemic, tachycardic, you know, there's a there's a sympathetic response to hypoglycemia. Okay, so we're saying I feel pretty B as well. Yeah. <laughs> we we better ask the audience. What does the audience think? Okay. Uh, the, I think look, I think um, three, four, five, three, four, five. I'm pretty sure on. Mm -hmm. uh, number two, I'm. I would have said no. But uh, La has convinced me otherwise. <laughs> uh, look, uh, what does everyone think? I'm gonna, I'm gonna on the chat. Up. So we've got here uh, hypoglycemia makes sense um, of beta blockers is lack of response to hypoglycemia. Fat cells equals beta one receptors. I think degree of hypothermia is important. I thought mild hypothermia causes increased SNS. Yeah, mild hypothermia causes tachycardia. Yeah, perhaps. And look, you, I think you're right. You know, like, sure, the de degrees are important, but I think when they, when you've got a statement like this, I think you have to go with what is probably um, the majority of cases. And for me, when I think of hypothermia, I think of, you know, less than 28 degrees and things shut down once you're hypothermic. But I totally take your point in terms of that, yes, in terms of uh, degrees of hypothermia, um, they would be differences mm. so we've got false true false true false yeah so the reason i think we've said hypoxemia is we, we see that you know hypoxemia decreased oxygen delivery sympathetic stimulation hypercapnia is a is a yes a, a, a indirect sympathetic nerve stimulated through central nervous system output yes um yeah so uh, i think i feel far more in line with either the false true 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 Okay, so we're going false, true, 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 true. All right, here we go. Let's lock it in. Let's Ooh. see what we get. Come on, it's exciting. <laughs> oh no! Oh, it was true. Oh, it was true. Yeah. Uh, well done, Tim. 
No, no, team was right. Okay. Hold it. Sorry. Oh, sorry, and increase as well. Yeah, and, and they've, they've specified mild hypothermia, but we'll get to that. Explanation. So it was all, all the answers were true. That is true for hypothermia, true hypoglycemia, catecholamine is secreted, increased, there is increased catecholamine secretion by hypothermia, hypoglycemia, hypoxemia, pain, and hypercapnia. So the explanation cells in the adrenal medulla synthesize and secrete the catecholamines, norepinephrine and epinephrine, which are stored in electron dense granules that also contain ATP and several neuropeptides. Secretion of these hormones is stimulated by acetylcholine release from preganglionic sympathetic fibers innervating the medulla. Many types of stresses stimulate such secretion, including exercise, hypoglycemia, pain, hypoxemia, hypercapnia, and trauma. The physiological consequences of medullary catecholamine, uh, so catecholamine release, are justifiably framed as responses which aid in dealing with stress. During mild hypothermia, the arterial concentrations of norepinephrine increase, which induces vasoconstriction. So that totally makes sense, but well take the point that severe hypothermia potentially goes the other way. <laughs> yeah. No, well done. Okay, well done. so there we go. Living point here, mild hypothermia um, can be um, a analyzing like in terms of uh, the most obvious description of hypothermia. So good stuff. Well done, guys. All right, next one. Mm -hmm. This is fun. Question five. Oh, is maybe it, I spoke too soon. Is it true or false? <laughs> Is it true or false that each of the following drugs act by affecting sodium channel permeability? So these again, true, false for five options. One, succimethonium. Two, diazepam. Three, carbamazepine. Uh, four, ethosuximide. That's ethosuximide. And five, minoxidil. Okay. Um, so definitely no for diazepam. That's GABA. That's GABA. Minoxidil, I think, is for hair loss, isn't it? And it's, but it's also a um, blood pressure lowering drug. So it can minoxidil, be both okay. A different dosing. Yeah. So it's not sodium. Uh, so succimethonium nicotinic acetylcholine receptors, uh, consistent end plate depolarization. And I, I do know that uh, it's meant to cause inactivation of the sodium channels. So I'm going to say, true for sucks. Carbamazepine is a anti-epileptic anti that works on sodium channels. Ethosuximide. Is that, is that an anti-epileptic as well? La? I don't know. Ethosuximide. Ask the audience. I Anyone think, is I think it's an anti-epileptic, but it doesn't it doesn't register with me as a sodium channel blocker. Um, what does everyone else think on the chat here? So I think um, oh, we've got an answer. I think someone said minoxidil is a calcium channel blocker. I think that's what. Okay. That was and also she, she said true, false, true, no idea, false, false. Yeah. So we're we're on on roll with that with the no idea and the others. Uh, ethos succimide. Ethos, I don't think so. I just don't. Just doesn't seem. Okay. And and in your in terms of your format on how you'd answer this, you know, when you've got no idea, you can you, obviously you can just go 50 50 on this. 50 50. But is there you know, anything I, else? I in... Right now, it's like there's some that that you have no idea, but you've got an inkling in terms of one or the other. Hmm. Um, I don't know. Ethos succimide just sounds no. It just doesn't sound right to me. Bruzamide relative, maybe. Okay. That's, that's a good I like the way you're thinking like um, L saying well, it's, it has a mite in it so maybe it's frizomide fru I, I think that's what you're saying okay um, it's good to try and relate these things <laughs> all right I'm, I'm locking in these answers here oh hold on Fraser says I've seen it given with Velproate before which is a sodium channel block blocker so I thought it acted by a different mechanism yep Okay, I agree. I agree that uh, yeah, if you're going to give a drug with another drug, you'd want it to be 
working um, on a different mechanism. So I like that uh, logic, Fraser. Exciting. Yes. Hey, well done. Go team. It's been long overdue. Yeah, there we go. 100%. <laughs> okay, the explanation. So all the answers we got correct. So it was true for sucks, false for diazepam, uh, true for carbamazepine, false for ethosuximide, and false for minoxidil. So carbamazepine is an anticonvulsant and blocks neuronal sodium channels, reducing the sodium ion flux until it is insufficient to evoke an action potential. Succinethenium is a deep polarizing neuromuscular blocker that in inhibits nicotinic acetylcholine receptors when voltage-sensitive sodium channels sense membrane depolarization as a result of activation of the acetylcholine receptors. They initially open and thereafter close and become inactivated. Diazepam is a benzodiazepine, which increases the chloride ion conductance yep. of the neuronal membrane. So it is funny. I mean, it's obviously works on GABA, but it works through chloride ions on GABA. So, I mean, it, 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 that just knows some serious detail for this, isn't it? Yes. Um, minoxidil is a potent vasodilator that opens ATP sensitive potassium channels in vascular smooth muscle, causing hyperpolarization and relaxation. Ethosuximide may act by reducing the calcium ion flux through T type calcium channels in thalamic neurons and is used in the treatment of absences and myoclonic seizures, hence why. We have not heard this in a very long time. There you go. All right. Well done, everyone. Good work. Good. Excellent. Question okay. six. Are the following true or false concerning morphine? So again, five options. One, causes direct myocardial depression. Two, has a higher affinity for the opioid receptor than diamorphine. Three, may cause bronchospasm. Four, increase the production of antidiuretic hormone ADH, and five is uh, phenylpiperidine. What do you okay, reckon? Uh, phenylpiperidine is like fentanyl, so it's definitely not that one. Mm -hmm. um, morphine's a phenanthrene, so that's a no. Um, can cause direct myocardial depression. Is it a direct effect? If it's anything, it's indirect. I mean, it can cause bronchospasm from histamine release. Mm -hmm. So we'll say yes to that one. Has a high affinity for the opioid receptor than diamorphine. Diamorph diamorphine is heroin. Mm -hmm. Heroin, heroin is a pro drug. Is it? I think so. Really? It needs to be. It needs to be. It needs to be acidulated before. No, but well, no, no. That that doesn't make sense because they use it for uh, in spinal anesthetics in in the UK. They wouldn't do oh, that. Oh, do they? It, if it was a pro drug, they wouldn't need to do that. Unless tramadol codeine are pro drugs. Unless unless it doesn't have uh, uh -huh. that. I don't unless in it doesn't have, have like the, the same sort of uh, effect as morphine. Because remember that there are so there are a couple of conce concepts here. Um, you would say that uh, they are equally as efficacious. In other words, they're a full, full agonist. We're not talking about potency here, so we're not, we're not, we don't need to compare about dose. What we're talking about is the strength in terms of how it binds to the receptor. Mm. And, it, and that's the thing, we don't, except for buprenorphine, I don't buprenorphine has is a very strong has very yeah. strong affinity so I, I i totally agree with that one i've never seen a comparative of affinity of the other opioids except buprenorphine because you know it's not a it's not a thing we've got here it just doesn't sound diamor just doesn't sound right to me diamorphine and morphine like i would think that my morphine would have high affinity mm -hmm. um I'm, I'm i'm gonna say false for this one it sounds good I don't think it caused direct myocardial depression unless anyone has read differently. It, I think it's indirect if, if uh, it is going to be a cause. Increases the production of ADH. Increases. Production of ADH. Is, it, is there a mechanism which where it increases ADH? So for me, ADH is a, 
ADH is released as a as part of one of the stress hormones. At the same time, um, you know, the use of morphine, I have seen as a potential cause of, of urine retention. But is that is that from ADH? I've got this, I've got this thing in my memory that it does increase. It the does? ADH. It's just a vague yep. memory. But okay. <laughs> yeah. Okay. People are, people are saying- You're helping me out with this one. Also, um, they're saying heroin is a pro-drug, yes. Um, is heroin? Yeah, I think, I think I look, I, look, I mean, it may have direct effects, but I certainly know that uh, hmm. dimorphine is metabolized to morphine. It probably doesn't so, matter for this question, though. Yeah. So I don't think, I don't think dimorphine by itself has higher affinity than morphine. I think, it's, I think this one's a little bit of a trick question. Okay. Okay. Uh, now, what does the audience think? Yeah, so we've got a few options here. So uh, it wasn't heroin developed as a more efficient morphine than swiftly removed as too addictive. Yep. I thought myocardial depression was specific to pethidine. Heroin is a pro drug, yes. Maybe they're trying to make you... I like this comment because, you know, if you're thinking that they're trying to trick you with things, maybe they're... You know that morphine can cause you your attention. So therefore, you know, maybe they're trying to tease that distinction out with the thing regarding ADH. Someone does right. is saying, I think it does increase the production of ADH, and I think opioids do increase ADH. I'm sure of the mechanism. Let's, okay. Uh, I, look, I'm I'm happy with that. I think um, yeah. I I have read that it has implications with ADH. I'm just not sure what the yeah, what the mechanism is. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's go. Okay. Oh, uh, oh, it's wrong. <laughs> okay, apologies. <laughs> Okay, here we go. That's all right. No. So are the following true or false regarding morphine? So it uh, false doesn't cause myocardial depression. So sorry, I'll just say the answer it is. So uh, it doesn't cause myocardial depression. It doesn't have a higher affinity for the opioid receptor than diamorphine. Sorry, it's Wait so a does. Second. It, you it does have a high affinity. <laughs> May cause bronchospasm, it increases the production of ADH and is not a phenylpiperidine. So yeah, morphine does not cause direct myocardial depression, although it may cause bradycardia. The hypotension associated with its use is because of a decrease in the systemic vascular resistance, SVR, which is due to in part to histamine release. The histamine yeah. release may also cause bronchospasm. The production of antidiuretic hormone is also increased by morphine. They're not telling us a mechanism for that. Diamorphine has almost no affinity, no yeah, affinity for the opioid receptor and is a prodrug of morphine. Well done. That's well. Hold on. Well, that's that, that's, that's what, what you're saying, saying. mate. No, I, I I may have I I may have messed it up for you there because that's no 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 no, no. false is um oh right it should be oh yes that's what I meant I meant that morphine has a high affinity ah oh, that's yeah. what I meant because I that's that's what I was saying is that dimorphine has a um is a pro drug so it's got it's got it's got uh, lower affinity. So morphine does have a high affinity. Oh my God, I completely misread the question. Yeah, wow. Absolutely misread the question there. <laughs> That's my, completely my fault. Like we yeah. we actually discussed it. And yeah. so- um, <laughs> But it does beg the question, why do they use it as an intrathecal agent in other, other countries? If it's got almost no affinity for the opioid receptor. Anyway, that's for another yeah, time. Sure. Yeah. Um, Phenylpropyridines, exactly what you said, include pethidine and fentanyl, whereas morphine is a phenanthrine derivative. Oh, good. You know what? This is a good learning lesson. And as I always say that, uh, you know, in some ways, this is an English exam and <laughs> I have just failed in English. I'm going to blame the alcohol because <laughs> I absolutely i absolutely knew that more that more uh more heroin was a pro drug i knew this was a trick question and mm -hmm. i knew that morphine had a higher well I, anyway I, I wasn't certain but i i did think that <laughs> morphine had a higher affinity yeah um that dimorphine but i completely misread this question and i actually thought um of it as the opposite but there's a good so, lesson right? like like you said make sure you get a good night's sleep and make sure you don't have a drink before doing the MCQ <laughs> because it, it, it's it's word games so true. Mm -hmm. All right. Let's go. Question okay. seven. Question seven. Are the following true or false of vecuronium? 
So again, five true or false statements causes the least histamine release of all the non-depolarizing muscle relaxants. The vial contains mannitol. It has active metabolites. It causes more anaphylaxis than rocuronium. An intubating dose is 0.2 milligrams per kilogram. Okay. Probably a drug that we use pretty commonly these days. Okay. Um, so yes, I, I would think that uh, it doesn't cause any histamine release. In fact, does rock even cause histamine release? Nope, unless you get anaphylaxis. So if you have if you've got a drug which doesn't cause histamine release like rock and vecuronium also doesn't cause histamine release <laughs> and you've got a statement here that, that says it causes the least histamine release yeah uh, I, I think um the least is uh, it's hard to know isn't it but cis cisatricurium causes oh no yes as well uh i will right, leave that there look i know it contains mannitol because that's always used for uh tonicity Mm -hmm. uh, it's got active metabolites. So three, um, the three hydroxy has got 80% of the potency of VEC. Mm -hmm. And there's also 17 and 317 as well. Mm -hmm. Causes more anaphylaxis than rock. That's false. Intubating dose is 0.2 milligrams per kilo. That's very high. Yeah. So that's false. It's just, um, it's just 0.1. Mm -hmm. Yeah, 0.1. And, and how do you remember it, La? Remember the doses? Yeah. Oh, I mean, point, point 0.1 for VEC, point 0.15 for CIS, point 0.5 for ANTRAC, point 0.6 is ROC, and then SUX is 1.5. <laughs> I don't yeah. know how I remember that. It's, so it um, the way that I remember it is, uh, look, VEC, VEC often comes uh, as 10 milligrams. So you dilute it into a 5 mil syringe, so it's 2 milligrams uh, per mil. And often I think about, you know, if you had an sort of like an average size added out, you know, how much would you want to give for, mm. for Vivek? Mm. And you should, you know, with, I think with most drugs um, that are out there, you do, you know, most drugs are catered for, for a, um, as in a one vial, one dose. So in mm. other words, if I was 80 kilos, um, you'd want to give eight milligrams, which is four mils. Hmm. The moment you have to draw up another vowel, I think that that's where the dosing is, you know, like I think that's where the dosing is incorrect. So in other words, like, you know, um, the fact that I'll need you, that I'll need to give eight milligrams uh, for myself, which is within that one vowel range, that's where that, that's how I remember the sort of the 0.1 milligram per kilo range. Hmm. And, you know, it's the, it's the same with most drugs. You should be able to give most drugs within sort of one vowel. Exactly. So you, yeah, you, if you if you ever lost, that's a great tip. You just look at the do dose in the vial, and you can get the milligrams per kilogram by knowing the dose in the vial. Except for metaraminol, do not. Yeah, that's <laughs> so true. And adrenaline. Yeah. Um. All right. Well, what do we think here? Cause the least histamine release of all non depolarizing muscle relaxants. Because I agree with you. Like cisatrac is. But but um, the. I guess the amino steroids are generally thought to be the least histamine releasing, but to me, I, I still think it's what you were saying that it's a dis, uh, is it, is it rock uranium or is it vec uranium? And the fact that vec uranium is more anaphylactoid or anaphylaxis causing that overall, it does cause more histamine release in, in all use cases. Whereas vec uranium has incredibly low, if no uh, reports of anaphylaxis in that naps in those nap studies. So maybe, that is the answer for that. Okay. So we say it's true. Yeah, go for it. All right. All right. Lock it in. Come on, lock choice. I was thinking. Yes. Yes. Oof. There you go. Well done, everyone. Okay. <laughs> Pharmacology. So learning points. Vecuronium has plenty of desirable characteristics that make it close to being an ideal agent. This makes it a popular topic in the examination, despite its relatively uncommon use. Oh, says who? Uh, Vecuronium is an amino steroid. It is presented as 10 milligrams of powder in mannitol and sodium hydroxide. It is a competitive inhibitor at the alpha subunit of the nicotinic acetylcholine receptor. An intubating dose is 0.1 milligrams per kilogram, which would produce intubating conditions in 120 seconds. It is the most cardiovascularly stable of, of the non-depolarizing muscle relaxants, having the most favorable histamine release 
and relate the anaphylaxis, right? So they, they did compound all of that together, it seems. Becuronium is metabolized by the liver to 3, 3, 17, and 17 dihydro, dihydroxybecuronium. 3 hydroxybecuronium is an active metabolite that will accumulate in real failure. Procuronium is the most likely to cause an anaphylactic reaction of all the non depolarizing muscle relaxants. Great good work. Okay, great work, everyone. Okay, let's go. Next one. Well done. <laughs> okay, question eight. So three, three to go now. Question eight. Regarding hyperventilation, which of the following is true and which is, and which is false? Again, five options, true or false. It may occur following cerebral injury. It may cause an increase in the blood pH. It decreases concentration of ionized calcium. It raises the pCO2 of arterial blood. It decreases the PO2 of arterial blood. Okay. Uh so two is definitely right because you're going to get a respiratory alkalosis. Uh, it's going to decrease calcium because that's associated with hyperventilation. It's not going to re it's not going to raise your PCO2. It's going to lower your PCO2. Um, and because you're delivering more oxygen, you should be able to increase your PO2. False. Oh, sorry. Decreases the PO. Sorry. Yes, that's, that's really another good. English um, <laughs> your, your ESL though, Stan, that's comprehension right. one there. Apologies. You understood what I said and I clicked the wrong one. That's right. Now, it may occur following cerebral injury. The may occur is quite a nice, uh, you know, that the strategy back in high school MCQs was if it's absolute, you say no. False. And if it's may, no. you say yes. But you say these, true. Yeah, but these, um, our exams are not like that. They absolutely go for the absolutes and they're still true, just like the last vecuronium situation. So that technique that we, I think a lot of us knew for high school doesn't really apply in this exam, I'd, I'd say. Yeah, all right. I think, uh, yeah, you know, I think it certainly can occur in cerebral injury as part of compensation. Mm. Happy with that, La? Doesn't oh, occur but, all the time, but, but I think that, it can occur. Yeah, the, the fact that this is May, have you ever, of all the stroke patients, have we ever seen it? Yeah, it, it's it's so general. May may yep. feels like it could be true. Yep. Yep. Come on, question eight. Question eight. Let's go. We're on a roll. Yes. Oh. There we go. Well done. Home stretch. Okay. The explanation. So we were correct for all of those. Uh, explanation. Hyperventilation is associated with a respiratory alkalosis that will raise the blood pH. It'll lower arterial PCO2 and may elevate the arterial PO2, not decrease it. Cerebral injury may initially precipitate hyperventilation, or the depressed respiration and hypoventilation are the predominant features. So that was interesting that, you know, the fact that it said it's may. The may bit, isn't it? As you yep. said, yep. The raised pH reduces ionized calcium concentrations, which is why tetany can occur in association yep. with hyperventilation. Fantastic. Good. Okay. Good. All right. And which of the following, so question nine, which of the following statements best applies to the anatomy of pediatric airways? This is always a fun one to learn. So again, five true or false questions. First one, neonates are not obligate nose breathers. Two, alveolar development is complete by the age of three years. Three, the carina is at the level of T4. Question four, by the age of one year, the vocal cords lie opposite C5, C6. And the final question, five, the larynx is more anterior than in an adult. <laughs> nice. Um, okay, so, so they're definitely, they are definitely obligate nose breathers. Not all, but most neonates are. Yep. So this is false. Um, the larynx is more anterior than in the adult, which is true. That's why, mm -hmm. you know, people use the Miller's blade, but up to you. I tend to just use the normal Mac blade. How about you, love? You, you're over in um, Broome at the moment doing pediatrics. What do you use? Yeah, I still use uh, just the normal blade. For, I mean, I mean, down to about two years, it, it doesn't matter too much, really. You just use a normal Mac blade, maybe usually a size two blade. Um, how, yeah. how about how about for prems? What do you what do you use for prems? I haven't I haven't intubated a neonate in a very long time, but I would use a because of, of the large epiglottis. Yeah, I've, I've got to say the. I, I just don't think it matters too much if your technique is right. Like, you know, you can use a Miller's on anyone, Miller's straight blade on anyone. If your technique is right, because it's just different. 
You've just got yeah. to do it the right way. And, and, you know, ENT surgeons, they're using a rigid suspension laryngoscope and a straight like rigid bronchial all the time. They're just altering their position to make it work. Um, so yeah, <laughs> I'd say yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm just going to do use whatever, just make sure I've got the right technique. Yeah. Um, alveolar development, three years, three years sounds very long. Like I would have thought it would be done, you know, Sooner. Um, should be done almost at term, I would think. So that's false. Karina, Karina at the level of T4, T T2. that sounds right. Adults probably around T6. So high is good. Because usually they talk about the Karina at the rib two level, don't they? So, so you reckon it's higher than that? No, no, no. Rib, rib, like second rib. And oh, is, okay. Like, you know, at the sternal angle, that's where the Karina. So the sternal yep. angle is roughly T4. I yep. think yep. that would make sense because it's near where the, what is it? The bottom of the scapula is T7 and the, and the spine of the scapula is T4-ish, I think. Yes. That's about right. And then... Uh... Age of one, vocal cords lie opposite C5, 6. That sounds very low to me. Yeah, so say the vocal cords are just where your C5, larynx six. is. No, 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 because no, that's, that's below the cry quote. No. Okay. False. All right. I'm happy with that. I'm pretty confident with that, actually. Oh. oh. <laughs> okay, oh, so you were right, large T two. Oh, hold on, it is T two. Yeah, you're right. But I, I, I don't think I was right. I was saying the rib level T two, second intercostal yep. space. Is that uh, anyway? Let's let's read this. So we've got all the answers right, but the carina was not at the level of T four. Is T two? So explanation: the lot, the tongue is large during the neonatal period reaching normal proportions by the age of one year. The vocal cords lie opposite C4 and only reach the adult position opposite C5, C6 by the age of four years, not one year. Yep. The larynx is more anterior in infants due to the underdeveloped cricoid cartilage, which is why the cricoid ring is the narrowest part of the pediatric airway. In the adult, the narrowest part of the airway is at the level of the vocal cords. The epiglottis is relatively large and inclines at an angle of 45 degrees to the laryngeal opening. The carina is at the level of T2 in the pediatric population and T4 in adults. Ah, so that's why I was thinking of the adult rather than... Yeah. yeah. The, the, and the left and right main bronchi divide at similar angles. Neonates have a comparatively small number of alveoli and this number increases to a maximum by the age of eight years, not three years. Uh, so we, we're actually going the wrong direction there. Someone actually... Oh, but we got it right. <laughs> yeah, Incidentally, yeah. there you go. Someone did say in the chat, Stolting said alveolar maturation isn't until age of age. Well it's fantastic. Well done. And neonates are obligatory nose breathers and any obstruction can cause respiratory distress, for example, coanal atresia. Okay. This is one of those uh, answers where we got, uh, we got it right just by thinking the opposite. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> okay. Last, last one. Question. Right. Last one, guys. 75-year-old woman is scheduled for surgery to a fractured neck of femur. Induction of anesthesia is achieved using one milligram midazolam followed by 75 milligrams propofol. Which of the following options best describes the pharmacological interaction between these two drugs? Ah, so you've got five options. Select one of these. Summation, additive, synergism, infra-additive interaction, potentiation. What do you reckon? <laughs> so this is a farm question. And the reason, and even without even reading the, the question, um, it's going to be summation. The reason for that is that synergism describes um, the increased effect of a drug via either by an additive effect or via potentiation effect. So that, but the fact that they've got those three th things there, they're essentially the same thing. So synergism is additive and potentiation. Infra additive interaction doesn't sound right at all. So summation is going to be the answer. And if you look at the question here, Medaz and Probes, they both work on GABA. Different sites of GABA, though. And I know. And I think that's the, that's the interesting thing because, you know, I guess if they didn't have that, you, you would try to almost push yourself that uh, it's synergistic. 
Mm. But, you know, like for me, drugs that are synergistic, um, you know, you could say like, uh, um, you know, benzos or opioids in, in terms of, um, you know, their effect on, or even like um, factors that, re that reduce um, your MAC requirements. Mm. And you could push yourself to synergism but the thing with synergism is that it's a combination of both um, additive and potentiation. So because they've got the they've, because they've got those concepts there, I don't think it's going to be that. I think it's going to be summation. And just to talk through it, if you gave one of midaz and seventy five milligrams of propofol, are we saying uh, uh, that the total effect is the rough combination of it, yes. or is it less the, than the, the combination, two. or is it more than the combination? No, 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 no. It's going to be the combination of the two. You're right. Yeah. And but synergism just means that it's it's above and beyond what you've um included for the for for the for the um for the two drugs. So let's say midazolam's effect is A and prop and the 75 of propofol's effect is B. Are we yes. saying that the effect of giving both is A plus B or is it correct? A no, less than A, plus, a plus B, B or is yeah, more yeah. Than so B. synergism is is the additive effect plus potentiation. So what what does A plus B uh, th these terms I'm not so familiar with now additive is isn't additive A plus B and summation is more than A plus B? Um, so an additive effect because you're right some... summation and additive do sound very similar, don't they? But I know that synergism is defined by the terms of by terms of additive and potentiation. Potentiation sounds like a plus, more than A plus B. Correct. So it's definitely not, I don't think it's potentiation. I mean, that's part, that's synergism. Um, that's part of synergism. I think it's just, I think hey, it's just summation. Yeah, I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna put it out there. Infra additive interaction sounds like it's less than the effect of both of them. And isn't there a chance that if like say, Propofol's effect on GABA is a maximal effect, right? You know, you, you give a whole bunch of propofol, you're not going to get any more effect by giving a bit of midazolam. So yeah. by giving propofol, then a bit of midaz isn't, it's, it's just a drop in the ocean of propofol. So could infra-additive interaction be the answer? <laughs> yeah, and um, yeah. Infra-additive interaction. I mean, what's people's experience? I mean, it, it could be, like, but, but it's a term I've never heard of before. But they're, they're trying to figure a way of saying, is it A plus B, which is additive or summative, I'm not sure, or is it yeah. potentiation, which is A plus more than A plus B, and then yeah. infra additive, so below additive interaction is A plus B, but less than that. Yeah. All right, let's, <laughs> let's read the chat for more clues, hey? Uh, I think we've got a, we've got a, lot of, a whole lot of chat. No one's going in for infra additive interaction, but um, you know what? <laughs> I'm just going to go with that. <laughs> uh, so we've got synergism, additive, additive question marks, max sparing, less dose needed, synergistic as per isobologram, and isn't summation equal additive? Yeah, I think it might be synergism. Good I point. decrease the dose of each required. Um, I think synergism, additive is linear. Yeah. And what is an example of additive? Local anesthetics could be additive. Okay. All right, what we're we gonna say? Infra additive interaction. Infra additive. I think people are going with C. C? Synergism? <laughs> Go with synergism. All right. The crowd has spoken. I'm changing the answer to C. Uh -huh. I am gonna hold A though, but I'll take credit for both. <laughs> That's All right. right? <laughs> All right, let's go. Let's go. Let's go. The suspense is killing me. <laughs> oh, well done. Hey, there well done, go. Team. <laughs> There you go. Okay, here, here's some examples of drug interaction. So, so pharmacology, the co-administration of the volatile anesthet anesthetic agents and non-depolarizing muscle relaxant produces pharmacological potentiation. Can you go up a little bit just to... Oh, sorry. That's right. So yeah, that, those are the key learning points. These are examples of drug interactions. Uh, additive interaction is one plus one equals two. 
The actions of combinations of intravenous agents such as ketamine and thiopentone or ketamine and midazolam are described as additive. They have different mechanisms of action. Ketamine is MDMA, whereas thiopentone and midazolam are GABA. Another example is nitrous and halothane. Synergism is super additive, so one plus one is greater than two. It refers to the administration of two drugs with similar, similar pharmacological profiles and closely related sites of action that produce an effect in combination that is greater than would be expected from the summation of the contribution of each component. These can be interpreted and understood by construction of an isobologram. The hypnotic effect of benzodiazepines and intravenous induction agents such as propofol is the best example. Midazolam is often administered prior to propofol as part of a co-induction technique. Potentiation um, is volatile agents potentiate the effects of neuromuscular blocking agents in a dose dependent manner. Effects of the neuromuscular blocking agents can be increased by electrolyte disturbance, hypermagnesemia, penicillin and probenazid. The latter has no similar pharmacological activity. Infraditive interaction antagonism is one plus one is less than two. This can be subclassified as pharmacokinetic interference, for example, one drug affecting the absorption of another by the gastrointestinal tract or influ influencing metabolism by hepatic microsomal enzyme induction. Chemical antagonism, for example, heparin and protamine, or heavy metals and cladding agents. And finally, competitive reversible, for example, opioids and naloxone, and irreversible antagonism of receptors. Okay. Great work. There you go. Well done, everyone. Good stuff. Um, that was fun. That was a, yeah, that was a good hour, about an hour of us uh, chatting through MCQ. That, that was really helpful. Uh, you know, I found it's been, obviously it's been a long time since I've gone through a few of these sections, but just being able to think through them, talk through them, and uh, yeah, this is this is quite useful. Yeah. Um, in fact, everyone in the chat, let us know what you think. Uh, if you found this useful and if you think it was a fun way to learn, <laughs> we'll definitely do it again. That was uh, yeah, our first MCQ live session with Anesthesia Coffee Break. So thanks everyone for watching. Uh, we'll post it up on Adrenaline Memories um, uh, as well as on the ABC's Anesthesia YouTube channel and of course on our podcast as well. So yeah, please share with anyone who might be interested and uh, yeah, see you guys next time. Thanks very much for listening and watching.